Hello and welcome to the Weber podcast, a special edition of European Talks, the only podcast fo focusing on the EU integration of the Western Balkan region. My name is Milena Lazarevic and I'm the program director of European Policy Center, TEP Belgrade. For a chat about the importance of reforming and modernizing the administrations in the Balkans and the role of the region's civil society in stimulating those changes, I'm joined today by Gre Gregor Virant, former Minister of Public Administration of Slovenia, now head of the SIGMA program in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Hello, Gregor, and welcome to the first episode of the Weber podcast. Hi, and thanks for having me. We're really happy to have you as uh, the first guest um, uh, to, to, to discuss uh, these issues. And I would like to start maybe to kick off with something that isn't always on our minds uh, this year. And that's how COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives and the nature of our work. Uh, Sigma program is part of a large administration of the OECD uh, with the seat uh, in Paris. Uh, funded by European Union with its seat in Brussels, but you have been working from your home in Slovenia for several months now, is that not so? Exactly, exactly. But I think that uh, uh, this COVID situation, uh, however terrible it is, uh, is also a kind of test of resilience of, of, of many systems, including uh, national public administrations, including uh, the bureaucracy of the European Union and including the bureaucracy of international organizations such as the uh, OECD. Uh, and uh, my general impression is that we were all able to adjust relatively uh, quickly in an agile way, uh, many times also in an innov innovative way. Of course, we as Sigma, we closely watched what was going on in our partner countries in the EU enlargement and neighborhood regions and I could say that uh, many if not most of uh, those countries actually adjusted to, to the new situation in a very similar way as the EU uh, member states. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest difference is the digital divides. Uh, you know uh, in countries where, uh, where digital readiness is really advanced and where it is possible to uh, somehow replicate the, the civil servant's digital environment from his or her office to his or her home, um, everything works very, very smoothly. Uh, in some other countries, of course, it is more problematic. Because what yeah. we learned is that uh, for effective teleworking, it's not enough to have a good internet connection and access to email, but you need much more. You need access to your files, to your databases to, to, to all the information systems that you and use. You also need uh, skilled managers and, uh, and digitally skilled uh, employees, uh, civil servants themselves. I was just going to say that um, now actually together with the Sigma program, we are in, we as TEP Belgrade are conducting a study on how the Serbian administration has been adapting uh, to, to the new teleworking, remote working environment. And where, where, whereas we're still in the middle of the research when discussing initially with the senior civil servants, we learned completely different uh, experiences from those that uh, immediately started to organize Zoom meetings and uh, started using uh, Microsoft Teams uh, to those that actually as managers ended up doing all the work because they could not organize their teams uh, mm -hmm. working remotely from their homes. So they actually ended up uh, taking a, and assuming most of the work of their uh, colleagues. And these are two completely dif different worlds just inside of one country. Yeah. So I was actually wondering uh, about the same thing with regards to the region. Is it more of a divide and difference between different countries or it's actually some other elements or some other fa factors that, uh, that are influencing how the administrations are adapting? It's a, it's a great point and, uh, and uh, a very interesting finding. Yes, um, shifting to, to, to telework and reorganizing uh, the services to, to be available and accessible to citizens during the crisis uh, was not only a technological challenge. Um, of course, it was important to, to, to have all the, the uh, IT support for that, but it was also a managerial challenge. And some, you know, coped with it uh, effectively and some didn't. Um, what was the probably the most important thing was uh, the managers to understand that it is 
okay uh, to give up the usual the usual micromanagement you know to control collaborators what they do where they are um, and how they spend their time and to shift more to management by objectives and results yeah more difficult and but also a much more effective way of of, of managing and and i would say that uh, hopefully um, we will take the lessons uh, from this crisis uh, 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 thinking and, and going um, uh, ahead. Yeah. I and would that say that will have transformative effects as well. Yeah, I hope so. And this is this is um, uh, sort of uh, this uh, big disruption of a moment in which uh, uh, there are two ways forward, I guess. One is to just not use this opportunity, this crisis as an opportunity and keep doing things the same old uh, ways. And the other one is actually to use and to even stimulate deeper reforms and, uh, and uh, uh, transformations, even in these re more rigid structures uh, such as public administrations. And this is where I get to, to um, our, uh, uh, let's say, our uh, uh, main initiative and, uh, and project in the region that I would also like to discuss uh, uh, a little bit with you about. Uh, we as a European Policy Center uh, have since 2015 been implementing um, uh, this uh, waiver project uh, that this, this podcast is also part of with EU support, with the financial support of the European Union, the same European Union that is supporting the Sigma program. Uh, with the OSTD and uh, what we have been doing is actually together with our regional partners uh, from the Think for Europe network, uh, we have tried to uh, uh, engage the civil society in the region, so not only our six uh, think tanks that comprise the regional network of think tanks, the Think for Europe network, but also many other civil society organizations in the region to engage them more in monitoring public administration reform. And of course, the first uh, challenge, the first obstacle which we faced was that many people, when you, when you say public administration reform, they think that this is something very technical, very boring, boring completely irrelevant for the you know, ordinary citizen. And that's also for the civil society, which basically is oriented very much in its work towards the citizens and their needs. But then, of course, you, when you start discussing with them, uh, they start to realize that public administration reform is about the very basis and the very essence of the way that a state, a government, provides the services to the citizens, interacts and engage, engages with the citizens, the way that it uh, uh, collects taxes, the way that it uh, uh, ensures guarantees of your civil and human rights when you uh, have business with, uh, with the administration, the way it treats vulnerable groups, uh, disabled citizens, uh, um, etc. So it is about so many things. And basically what Sigma has done in the last year is, is that it has systematized uh, this, um, uh, this whole area and all the principles and requirements that the Western Balkan countries need to implement in order to become good uh, students and good, good member states, hopefully one day, uh, from the perspective of the functioning of the public administrations. But then we have also started to use your principles, Sigma's principles and these requirements to stimulate the work of the civil society. And basically what we have started to do is in a way emulate what Sigma has been doing in terms of providing external monitoring and external assessment of the way that the administrations are uh, performing public administration reform and how they are modernizing, innovating, how they're opening up, whether they're opening up, whether they are becoming more accountable, more efficient, more transparent, more professional. And we're giving our own assessments, just like Sigma gives its own assessments. But sometimes it has been also difficult to explain and prove uh, the relevance of our work, uh, because sometimes, for example, we got responses from the administrations uh, saying, yes, but Sigma is already monitoring us. So why are you now in the civil society again monitoring us? Everybody's monitoring us. And we're also monitoring our own policies. So. What's your view on this? Is there an added value in civil societies in the region um, doing this kind of work and learning how to, to provide this kind of, you know, uh, objective or independent assessments of, uh, of the administration's work? Mm -hmm. uh, well, a brief answer would be absolutely yes. And let me elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, firstly, um, you are absolutely right on the importance of public administration reform and it's not a coincidence that uh, 
for quite some years now, uh, public administration reform has been uh, one of the so-called fundamentals of the EU uh, enlargement process. So country without a stable, well-functioning, uh, professional public administration simply cannot cope with all the challenges of EU uh, membership. But of course, it's, it's also, it goes without saying that uh, what the enlargement countries are doing in this field is not for the sake of Brussels, or not only for the sake of EU accession, but is mainly for their own uh, citizens. Or at least it is supposed to be so. <laughs> exactly. Now, when it comes to monitoring and uh, uh, pressure that is exercised on, uh, on national governments in this area, um, well, um, pressure, I would say a moderate pressure is always good for better performance. Monitoring and measurement is even better for performance. Just, you know, they say uh, only what gets measured uh, also gets done. Yes. So from this perspective, of course, any type of uh, uh, pressure, scrutiny, uh, measurement and ass assessment is uh, very, very important. It comes from different ways, uh, obviously. It comes, uh, from, uh, it comes from, from the political waters, from the opposition. It's very important. Of course, uh, this type of pressure is, is uh, very political. It can be biased, uh, but it's important. This interaction um, uh, between, between the government and the opposition and exchange of ideas and criticism and so on is important to move things forward. Then it's the media, you know, the media have to be critical, uh, have to scrutinize uh, the government in this respect. Then it's the EU with its um, regular progress reports, um, which and always... And Sigma's work actually informs uh, EU's progress report. This is true, yeah, this is what I wanted to say. So, so there is always a part, a chapter on public administration repo uh, report, you know, on public administration reform in the progress reports, and indeed, it's very much based on, on Sigma findings. Um, let's say our uh, comparative advantage is that we are in our assessment very methodic, very systematic and very comprehensive. So we come to a country, we have a very clear framework, policy and measurement framework, and we measure against uh, the principles and sub-principles. And now comes, of course, the question... Uh, where, this is where, precisely, I just wanted to say where, that this is the precisely... Society. Yeah, this is precisely can, why we wanted really, to emulate stigma in our work, because you are so methodic and comprehensive and uh, evidence-based. Yes, yes, and we are very happy about it, obviously, I, and we, we think that it's the best way to, to go about it. Uh, it was the best way for you to go about it. Uh, where we see the added value, I mean, there, there are various, there are many things where we see the added value of uh, such initiatives. One is definitely that you are uh, closer to the source. So you know the situation uh, better. You have, you have more uh, insider uh, type of information. Um, uh, you, you, are, you, you simply know the situations in your respective countries better. That's obviously one of the advantages that you have. You can go into more detail. Um, you can be more thorough. You know, Sigma assessments, we, we come, we stay for a couple of days in the country and, and we go. Um, and of course, you have all, you also have a different focus. You are more interested in certain elements, like the element of, uh, um, for example, uh, citizens' views on the quality of services, yeah. uh, the aspect of uh, uh, of uh, public participation, public consultation in policy making processes, the aspect of openness and transparency of public administration, um, and and so on and so forth. So these are definitely elements which are very important and which nicely complement the work of Sigma, the, the work of the European Commission in this field. Yeah, indeed. And uh, uh, actually, when we started to develop this uh, power monitoring methodology uh, already in the first Weber project, because now we are, in fact, implementing already the second uh, cycle, the second uh, Weber project, uh, where we are even taking further our citizen orientation approach and we are now going to engage the citizens directly into campaigns and, and gather citizen feedback 
uh, through not only through opinion polls, but also through their anecdotal evidence, through their uh, proposals, through their uh, ex personal experiences with the administration. So we will give it more, even more of a human face. This was one of the conclusions from the, from the first uh, project. But when we started to develop this methodology, we realized two things. First of all, that we don't have the capacity to cover all of the Sigma principles um, uh, that, uh, that Sigma analyzes itself but also that we don't have to analyze all of those principles because uh, simply from the perspective of the civil society, we don't really need to directly care so much uh, how the evaluation of the work of civil servants is done internally in the administration or you know, some, how some internal mechanisms and procedures in the administration work as long as we can see that there is a good interface with the, with the citizens, that there is openness and transparency to the citizens, that there are mechanisms for accountability towards the public, etc. So we tried to select those areas and those, uh, those of the requirements uh, which, uh, which are assessed by Sigma, but to uh, those which are most relevant for the perspective of a, of a citizen and of the civil society, and to somehow try also to approach them from the more um, let's say local perspective. So to ask civil society's experience and opinions, to ask citizens' opinions, etc. And then we have collected those in uh, in um, uh, reports, which are called power monitors, and which uh, yes. we try to advocate with the administration. But I have to say that our experience has been that for us as civil society, although we are kind of bringing this uh, view and voice of the citizens. And somehow we felt that maybe this was not sufficiently done in the first project. This is why we are now adding more of the voice of the citizen. Despite this, our administrations are not as ready and as willing to hear our views and our recommendations as, as they're uh, willing and at least they show that they're willing to hear EU's and Sigma's recommendations. So why is that? I mean, how did we come to this uh, situation that our government and our leaderships appear to be more responsive to these external conditionalities than to the bottom-up pressures coming from their own civil societies and citizens. Is it about political will? Is it about trust? Where do you think this comes from? And how can we further, you know, induce, uh, um, let's say, more of a listening from our government yes. or the civil society? Can you yeah. help, can, can Sigma and the EU help with this? Yes, yeah. let me first start with uh, just reflecting on, on uh, what you were explaining about, the, about your, uh, your uh, work and the, the selection of areas where you mm -hmm. got involved. Um, I think you selected the right ones. Uh, there are so many interesting information in your monitoring reports. There are, there are so many topical and, and, and catchy issues. Uh, just, just to give you one example, the, the question the question to civil servants whether they think that you need a connection that you need to know someone to get a job in in public administration which was largely responded uh, positively so i think that close to 50 percent of civil servants and these are the civil servants who were selected in in in, in, uh, in the same way probably <laughs> who won the uh, the competitions so they think or they admit openly that that you need a connection um, the undue influence, the undue political influence uh, on the, the top manager, managerial level. These are all very, very interesting questions. And I also have to say that your, uh, your way of visualizing uh, your reports and your data is very catchy. So your are uh, nice to, to see and, and very clear and, and, and simple and you know, understandable to everyone. No. Can I just, can I just interrupt you here for one sentence, just for our viewers and listeners, just to say that all this information and data we're talking about can be found on the website of the Weber project, which is www.par-monitor.org. Uh, and uh, yeah, continue from here. I just wanted to not forget to mention the website because otherwise people won't be able maybe to, uh, to find the, this information. Sure. About. Sure. Now, on your on your question, um, well, I th I think that that the governments do hear you. Maybe you you often have impression that they they don't, but you know, um, I think they do hear you, and they will hear you more and more. Uh, now, of course, 
at the moment for all the Western Bal Balkans governments, uh, the, 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 the priority of all priorities is the EU uh, accession. So for me, it is very understandable that uh, they attach a lot of importance to the feedback from the European Commission because this is what steers the, the process and here and I think also the sensitivity of the, of the citizens is very uh, high in, in this respect. Um, so it, it will, they will hear you more and more and actually what, what you are doing when you are uh, showing uh, their own uh, picture in the mirror is you're also you are reflecting what the citizens think and of course the governments have to listen to the citizens if they want to survive uh, politically to, to, to say so. we certainly hope so. there's also one very interesting uh, uh, finding that I'm sure you will agree on we, we all um, uh, find, find the same situation in all countries there are some uh, uh, areas of public administration reform where where governments are eager to advance and to you to, to do the steps in the right direction and this is mainly the service delivery yes, service delivery it's uh, politically, it politically very, very convenient yeah <laughs> very convenient and uh, and uh, it's um, uh, uh, of course it it, it brings uh, votes uh, and so on but on the other hand there are elements they don't want to hear about you know they just close their their ears to some of uh, of the messages uh, especially on the on the importance of merit based recruitment um on the importance of um, you know putting uh, merit and professionalism and integrity before politics yeah. political Loyalty. I'm not saying that politi that confidence between the minister and the top civil servant is not important. It is, but you know, first comes the the, the knowledge and, 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 and experience and uh, um, and the competencies of the civil servant. So there are some some elements where you know where, where governments uh, still don't understand or they or they don't want to understand. They simply think that you know they know best how to. Do it. They know best how to uh, select uh, uh, the top managers in the in the civil service, ser uh, civil service. But on the long run, of course, we all know that it doesn't work like this. And yes, I all... think that that we are somehow sharing the mission together with Sigma. We in the civil society in kind of directing our administrations uh, towards uh, more professionalism and more merit-based and more openness and accountability because in the end this is in the interest of our own citizens and every one of us as a citizen uh, in uh, in our countries and i think that somehow you know i hope at least that because uh, sigma will be helping our governments and ass assessing and assisting our governments as long as they are candidate countries once we hopefully <laughs> become eu member states sigma's mandate basically will be over and then there will be the question who will continue to exert this uh, external pressure and to kind of keep pushing the government to keep doing the same reforms because we have seen in some central eastern european countries that after they became eu members they started to go back to the old practices and if there isn't a, an able and uh, strong civil society to, to keep pushing them towards uh, this meritocracy, accountability, professionalism, openness, then it is very easy to slide back into bad old habits. It's like uh, falling off the wagon <laughs> yes, in, uh, yes. for administrations. <laughs> no, that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the uh, country-specific recommendations in the framework of the European semester, you will see that, that for some of the EU member states, uh, those recommendations relate to public administration reform. And that Increasingly so, yeah. The EU member states have very similar problems as, as the enlargement countries. Uh, um, let's not blame and, 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 and shame uh, yes. specifically, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think that um, in a way uh, problems, public administration reform problems in some of the EU member states can, can be compared with the, the problems in, in Serbia or Montenegro or elsewhere in the enlargement region. So from this perspective, you are absolutely right. There has to be some kind of uh, 
uh, monitoring after after uh, accession, um, and uh, and of course uh, you are in you are so well positioned to 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 uh, carry it out and to be uh, effective in this respect. So I think there's there's good future for and good perspective for initiatives such as uh, Weber. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, thank you for the encouraging words. And I'm really happy to have had this conversation with you today. Uh, I think you, we, you and I know that we could go on talking about this uh, for an entire day. Hours. Uh, but let's, uh, let's give our viewers and listeners uh, a break. And we hope that they will come back uh, to, to listen to our and watch our uh, podcast uh, in the future. And I'm sure that we will have you or someone else from your team uh, back again in some months to uh, discuss uh, additional and maybe more in-depth um, uh, issues. Thank you so much for, for joining us once again. Uh, for everyone, uh, the information about the project can be found on the website of the Weber project, uh, www.par-monitor.org. Um, and you can also easily Google uh, Sigma OSCD um, on the internet and find out uh, more about what, uh, what great work Sigma, Sigma does uh, in the region and in other even countries, not only in the Western Balkan region. Thank you, Gregor. Have a lovely day. And uh, I really do hope that uh, the next time we speak, you will be back in Paris and uh, work will resume to normal for all of us, at least to a new normal. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best. All the best.